Thank you, Debbie. Jason and Bobby, thank you so much for your thoughts as we led to our worship uh, this morning. You know, uh, we're in this series, The Name Above All Names. And Jesus Christ has been given the name that is above all names, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so I'm really excited about going through this series as we lead into Christmas because I think sometimes it's the simple things that mean the most. And when you think about the names of Jesus, like we talked about last week, Jesus' name itself means the Lord saves. I mean, what a simple, powerful message. And if you put your trust in Jesus, you're putting your trust in the one who can save you. And this morning, as we're looking at some of the different names and some of the different titles of Jesus, we're going to see how they relate to how Jesus relates to us. And so, as we talk about titles here today, I just want to ask, do titles really matter? You think about all the different titles we have out there for jobs and stuff. I, I found a few that I thought, some of them were a little ridiculous. But maybe you've known somebody that's had a ridiculous job title. Uh, so here's a few that I've found. This one is a digital overlord. That's a website master. Someone who, who runs a website. They're the digital overlord. A retail Jedi. Well, that's someone who assists someone in a shop. <coughs> They're a retail Jedi. I like this one. The Wizard of Light Bulb Moments. That is a marketing director. So the light bulb, like the light bulb turns on and it's like, aha. So they're the wizard of marketing of light bulb moments. The chief chatter, that's the call center manager. And the part-time czar, well, that's the assistant manager of a store. So some of those titles, they're pretty ridiculous. So maybe you've heard others that are like that. It makes us maybe think that really titles don't matter. And it's more about the person behind the title. And while the person behind the title is very important, titles do have significant meaning, especially in the Bible. Uh, Jesus has given several titles that demonstrate how he relates to each one of us, and it's important for us to see that. You know, in my office, as some of you know, I've been moving over to the, the office there in the corner, the senior minister office, and I've been hanging up all my stuff on the wall the last couple of weeks, and I put, I've got this poster I've had since Bible College, and it has the names of Jesus. It's got about 50 different names on there with scriptures. I think I've mentioned it before. But I put it right there, and as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking all of these names are unique and important. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at, over the next four weeks, four titles that are given to Jesus in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. So let's read that together. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. As we look at the first of these today, the Wonderful Counselor. We're going to see how that is not just a job description for Jesus, but how it is important to how we see him as our leader and as our God. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for today and this time where we can worship you. And I pray that as we dive deep into your word, that you would speak to us, that you would show us the need for Jesus to be that wonderful counselor in our lives. So God, may you open our hearts and our minds and may you be with us here today. May we learn from you. May we seek you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, often we do put a little too much emphasis on titles. But, you know, titles do mean something. If anybody is a fan of the, the show The Office, you know there's a difference between assistant to the regional manager and assistant regional manager, right, Alex? Yeah, I know. So there's a difference there in the way things are worded. And some titles can actually be a little misleading. When I worked at the bank, I had a couple of titles that I thought sounded pretty important. Uh, one of the titles I had was uh, Loan Operations Specialist. I thought, that sounds pretty important. I'm a specialist. What that really meant was that I filed and reviewed and processed loan documents. Okay, well, I mean, it's an important job, but a specialist, that seems a little much. 
And then I got this title. It was Customer Experience Officer. And I thought, ooh, I'm an officer now at the bank. But you know what that was? Bank teller. <laughs> but the title really sounded good. You know, you put that on your resume. I'm a customer experience officer. Well, the job didn't quite match the name of the title. And it's easy to dismiss these things as being meaningless. Like, it really doesn't matter what you call it. You know, the job is still the job. But if a title is rightly given, properly used, a title actually is significant. In fact, it signifies a distinct relationship. So if you have a title in a job, that is distinct to the work that's being done and to the people that you work with. You have a manager, you have a customer service rep, those kinds of things. In family, your title is distinct to how you relate to your family members. A parent relates differently to their children, a child relates differently to their parents, siblings relate differently together. I'm sure you saw some of that over the last couple of weeks uh, during Thanksgiving. Uh, if you're on a team, uh, the, the title is distinct to your role on the team. A first baseman has significant responsibilities. A power forward has a job to do. A wide receiver, you don't expect them to cover all the, the different jobs. They have a specific role. And in government, uh, it, it distinct, the title is distinct to your responsibilities and representing the people. And so here's the thing, that if you're given an important title, the title really doesn't mean anything if the person is not up to the task. So the po person holding the title must be up to the task of fulfilling its role. What makes or breaks that title is not how important it actually sounds, but how the person that holds the title handles that responsibility. And this is really the context for what we're reading here today. You know, so many times with these verses in the Old Testament, these prophecies about Jesus, it's really easy to just kind of pick them out and say, okay, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And we just sort of lose the bigger picture of what's being said here in the, in the scripture. So in these chapters in Isaiah, it's actually Isaiah's chapter, chapter 7 through 12, this can be kind of designated the book of Emmanuel. This is Isaiah prophesying to King Ahaz of the southern kingdom of Israel uh, about the Messiah. So to give you a little background here, King Ahaz of the southern kingdom, Israel was split into two, there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Ahaz, the king of the southern kingdom, he is not following God in anything. In fact, he is instituting idol worship, he's turning the people's hearts away from God. He is not a good, righteous king. And when trouble comes, when actually the northern uh, kingdom of Israel wants to attack the southern kingdom of Judah, where Ahaz is king, Instead of turning to the Lord, Ahaz tries to make these political alliances with other countries. And so he turns to the Assyrian Empire and tries to make an alliance with them. But before he makes this set in stone, Isaiah is sent to warn him, to give him this message, to say you need to turn to the Lord. You don't need to rely on human power or worldly authority or military might. You need to rely on the Lord. And so in chapter 7 of Isaiah, we get another famous verse, another famous prophecy about the Messiah. But it's important to see why this was given. So Isaiah chapter 7, verse 10, says this. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. This is through the prophet Isaiah. It says, ask a sign of the Lord your God, and let it be as deep as Sheol, or as high as the heaven. Now, Sheol is one of those Old Testament words. It represents the place where the dead go. That's what they thought of as the place of the dead. So if you ever see Sheol, it might be a little confusing. It's talking about as deep as where the dead go, which was thought to be the center of the earth, uh, figuratively, uh, or as high as heaven. But King Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Now, if you pause right there, that actually sounds like a pretty good thing. Ahaz says, I'm not going to ask the Lord anything. I'm not going to put him to the test. But really what this is, is this is a stubborn refusal to submit to God. Because what happens in the very next verse, Isaiah says, you should ask God for a sign, anything, as low as the depths of the earth or as high as the heavens, and God will give you a sign. And Ahaz says, no, I don't need a sign from God. I'm good. 
I, I've got to figure it out. I'm going to go talk to the king of Assyria, and we're going to make this thing work out. So Isaiah then says, in verse 14, verse 13, and he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you also weary God? God was getting tired of his stubbornness. So then he says in verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and, she, and he shall call his name Emmanuel. So the very first prophecy about Emmanuel is in response to a king who was not up to the task. This king was supposed to be leading the people to follow the Lord more closely. But he refused to do it. He was relying on his own power, his own strength, his own military might. So he had tired God with his stubbornness. And God says, I will give you a king, Emmanuel. And not only will he lead the people the right way, but he will be God with you. That's what the name Emmanuel means. And so King Ahaz was not up to the task. And this prophecy about Jesus was given as a direct result of this leader turning away from God. He sought after idols. Instead of trusting in God's power, he went after his own military power. In fact, it even says that he sacrificed his own son to the idols of the Assyrian Empire to try to persuade them to help him. This was a man who was far from God. And so these prophecies about the king, about Emmanuel, about the Messiah being our wonderful counselor, it's in a direct opposition to this earthly counsel that they've received for too long. So here's the thing. It's important to look at people that we have in our lives that are influencing us. Are there people that are leading us away from worshiping God? Are there people that are encouraging us to rely on worldly wisdom instead of seeking God's will for our lives? <laughs> because sometimes we don't realize that we're being led astray. The people that we trust, the people that are the closest to us, they might have good intentions, but the advice they give us might actually be against what God really wants in our lives. That's why we have to turn to the Scripture, and we have to turn to Jesus as our wonderful counselor. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 and 18 says this. It says, For you say, I'm rich and I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you, this is Jesus talking, I counsel you, buy from me gold that is refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and buy salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Jesus says, you think you've got it all under control. You think you're listening to the right advice. You think you understand, but really you are blind. You are not turning to me. You're turning to the ways of this world. And this very first title given in Isaiah 9, 6 indicates that Jesus is a different kind of counselor than any counselor you could have here in this world. So let's break this down. What does it really mean that Jesus is our wonderful counselor? Let's look at that again. Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Let's look at that first word, wonderful. Everything about Jesus inspires wonder. From his birth, to his life, to his teaching, to his sacrifice, to his humility in the face of false accusations, to the way he died, to the way he rose again, and the way he empowered his disciples to spread the good news. Everything about Jesus inspires wonder. It says in the scripture that people were in awe of him because the way he taught was one with authority, not like one of their other teachers. Matthew 15 verse 31 says the people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they praised the God of Israel. Everywhere Jesus went, he inspired awe and wonder. And Jesus can inspire and amaze you 
unlike any counselor in this world can do. Only Jesus can do that. And you can be sure that his counsel is greater than any worldly counsel because Jesus is the very wisdom of God. He is the embodiment of the wisdom of God for us. You don't have to question if what Jesus says is right or true. It is God's wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctific sanctification and redemption. Every single one of us needs godly wisdom in our lives. And we can get that only from Jesus. So the people that we turn to, the advice that we read online or the books that we read, if they're not pointing us to Jesus, they're pointing us away from Him. Now wisdom is not simply knowledge about facts or information. Wisdom is insight to the very nature of things, to its very reality. And through Jesus, we have access to the very nature of God. We can be sure of His reality. He teaches us about righteousness. That's right standing with God. He teaches us about sanctification, which is the process in which we are made holy. That He goes and changes our hearts. He takes away our sin. He helps us overcome those temptations and makes us more like Jesus Christ. And through redemption, by paying our debt, so that we can be set free. We don't have to fear death. We don't have to fear hell. We don't have to fear punishment because Jesus has redeemed us. And He is our wonderful counselor because only He can do these things. No one else can make you holy. No one else can redeem you. No one else can make you right with God. It is only Jesus Christ. But you say, well, how does He do that today? Jesus went back to heaven 2,000 years ago. Well, remember what He said, that when I ascend to heaven, I'm going to send someone. And it's better that I send someone to you because He will teach you all things. The Holy Spirit, the Counselor that lives in us. The word for Counselor when it describes the Holy Spirit is paraclete. And it literally means the one who walks beside us. We have the Holy Spirit of God walking beside us, living in us every single day if we are a Christian. And the Holy Spirit gives us access to the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 9 says, As it is written, What no eye has seen, and no ear has heard, nor heart has ever imagined, what God has prepared for those who love them, these things God has revealed to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. Think about that. You have access to knowing the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except for the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things that are freely given to us by God. The Holy Spirit teaches us. It helps us understand. He helps us understand. He helps us understand the mind of Christ Himself. Verse 16. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit is a tremendous gift. He gives us access to the depths and knowledge of God. And we can understand that through reading the Word through prayer, through connecting with Him, we can have the very mind of Christ to lead us. Jesus is our wonderful counselor because He reveals to us the things that no one else could know. What God has prepared for those who love Him. No one has seen how high or how deep or how wide or how big the love of God is for us except for Jesus Christ. And He teaches us these things. He searches the very depths of God. If you go deeper in your faith, you need to follow Jesus. And we've all had experiences where people have led us astray. You can probably think of someone right now that gave you some bad advice. 
that you wished you would have taken. Or maybe you've been that person where you thought you were helping somebody, but the advice you gave them actually wasn't the best thing to them at all. We make mistakes. Humans are fallible. We don't know everything, the depths of God, but Jesus Christ does. That's why he is our wonderful counselor. Many of us, when we ask for someone's advice, it's kind of like that plaque that says, if you ask enough people long enough, eventually you'll get the answer you really wanted. And that's the way we are. I'm like that. I get my opinion set on things, and I ask for somebody to tell me what they think. Not because I really want anybody to challenge my opinion. I want to confirm my opinion. So we have this bias in ourselves that we can't trust our own mind to lead us. And we can't trust people with worldly wisdom to lead us. We have to trust in Jesus to lead us. We can't lead ourselves because we lead ourselves down the wrong path. No one else has access to the very mind of God and no one else can reveal to you the things that Jesus Christ can. The things that God has planned for those who love him and no one else but Jesus Christ can inspire you in your life today. I want to close with a scripture from Psalm chapter 16. It talks about what it's like to rely on the counsel of the Lord. Psalm chapter 16, verses 7 through 11. David writes the psalm and he says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night, so that also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices and my flesh dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. David says that if you let the Lord be your counselor, if you walk side by side with him, he will guide you down paths of righteousness, the paths of life. You want to know what God's plan is for your life? Get to know Jesus. Know him better. Read his word. Pray to him. Make him the leader. Because bottom line, we all need Jesus to guide us. There's not a person here today that can make it to heaven without Jesus. There's not a person here today that can overcome their sin, their, their past, their temptation without Jesus. Every single one of us, whether you've been in church your entire life or this is your first time walking through the doors, every single one of us needs Jesus to guide us. So I ask, is Jesus your counselor? Is Jesus leading you here today? Or are you relying on self-help books, worldly advice, the internet? What's stopping you today from making Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? He wants to lead you in the paths of righteousness, in the paths of life everlasting, to have the joys that are inexpressible. Because knowing God is the greatest thing that we can ever do. And having a relationship that's right with Him is the best Christmas present we can ever receive. So think about that here this morning. Is Jesus your God? Is Jesus your counselor? Let's pray. Lord, we do thank You that You are wonderful, that You are inspiring awe, in all of us, that you have done great things and you continue to do great things. And God, you are amazing. And God, we thank you that your wisdom is pure and it is holy and it is the absolute best thing, the best advice we could ever take. So God, I pray that you would guide us today and every day, each one of us, no matter if we've been a Christian all our lives or if we just made that decision to here today. We all need your guidance. We all need you to lead. So please go with us here today. And if there be anyone here today that needs to make that decision for the very first time, may you inspire them and motivate them to make that commitment to you to here today. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name.
We pray all these things. Amen.